We're back in Isaiah today, and really we're in a new section. There are three distinct sections in Isaiah, uh, chapters 1 through 39. Uh, those first 39 chapters really were addressed to the nation of Israel before they went off to Babylon as prisoners. So that was prior to them being taken. Uh, and it was a warning that uh, they, would be, uh, they would fall if they did not put their wrong and evil ways aside. Uh, chapters 40 through 15, uh, excuse me, 40 through 55, these were 16 chapters, and these addressed the nation of Israel during the time they were prisoners in Babylon. This was Isaiah looking past his own life and ministering to Israel while they were in Babylon, uh, and that's what we ended yesterday, uh, last Sunday was chapter 55 in Isaiah. So this is the beginning of a new section. This is the last of the three sections. Uh, and really, there are sections that are considered kind of unique because of the topics, uh, the before, the during, and really what chapters 56 through 66 address is Israel after their imprisonment in Babylon. And, uh, and it's almost entirely concerned with getting back to the land and how they are to behave when they get there. So uh, this is ultimately the last lap. <clears throat> And uh, with the grand climax coming in chapter 66. So we, we have a lot of wonderful, wonderful scriptures to come uh, that really speaks to what the Lord is eventually uh, going to bring about for us, for you and me. Um, but today, really, the question that's being asked is, uh, I guess one, I was looking at one commentary, and they were saying this was like a hotly debated topic in Babylon. And ultimately, and, and as you can imagine, as they were getting near to a time of going back to the land, their question was, well, who's included? Uh, who's included? Because some, some tough things happened. Some people uh, who were, uh, a lot of times when men are taken captive and brought into another land, they're, uh, they be, they're made into eunuchs <clears throat> to prevent them from uh, expanding their families and becoming a threat to the country they're living in. Uh, so... Ultimately, the Israelites are wondering, you know, what about someone like that? Because someone that was a eunuch was excluded from the temple because of their physical uh, disability there. And uh, another one that was never really looked at, uh, looked upon with uh, great care were foreign nations, Gentiles. And I, I, th I found it encouraging to think that uh, Israel's presence in Babylon brought with it some conversions. There were people in Babylon. This was a pagan, superstitious place. All of a sudden, they're introduced to this God, the God of the Jews, a God of, uh, you know, purity, a God of uh, excellence. And as you can imagine, people wanted to be part of that. So the Jews allowed them to be part of what they were doing. And now the big question is, well, what about them? Can they come back with Israel? And it also addressed, ultimately, the, the fact that the leaders of Israel in that time of Babylon really dropped the ball. But God knew that, uh, you know, the Jews that were under that leadership suffered. So it speaks to that same question, too. What about the ones that might have been misled by the leaders during that time? So uh, really, the message, uh, the title of my message today is, Come One, Come All, because that's really the approach God has. So we're going to read chapter 56. I've given you kind of a little introduction, so you, maybe you could be thinking about it as we go through it. But it's a good message to give. I love to, uh, to share about the generosity of God, that God is not just for one particular people, uh, that he has an open door to any that would turn to him. So let me read this together. Uh, this is what the Lord says. Be just and fair to all. Do what is right and good, for I am coming soon to rescue you and to display my righteousness among you. Blessed are all those who are careful to do this. Blessed are those who honor my Sabbath days of rest and keep themselves from doing wrong. Don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will never let me be part of his people. And don't let the eunuchs say, I am a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says. 
I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. I will also bless the foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not desecrate the Sabbath day of rest, and who hold fast to my covenant. And I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. For the sovereign Lord who brings back the outcasts of Israel says, I will bring others too besides my people Israel. Come wild animals of the field. Come wild animals of the forest. Come and devour my people. For the leaders of my people, the Lord's watchmen, his shepherds are blind and ignorant. They are like silent watchdogs that have given no warning when danger comes. They love to lie around sleeping and dreaming. Like greedy dogs, they are never satisfied. They are ignorant shepherds, all following their own path and intent on personal gain. Come, they say, let's get some wine and have a party. Let's all get drunk. And then tomorrow we'll do it again and have an even bigger party. Good people pass, oh, excuse me, and that's the end of chapter 56. All right, that is the reading of God's word. Why don't I open up in a word of prayer that our minds are uh, ready to receive what he has for us and that he uh, accomplishes in our lives the changes he wants to make, right? We're all in a process of change. Anyone here not changing? Well, I, I hate to break it to you, you're supposed to be. We're supposed to be changing in a good direction, and, uh, and that's what his word does for us. He, uh, he brings us wisdom, he exposes our sin, and he calls on us to turn to him. So let's pray. Lord, we come together today grateful that your word is living and active. Even today, it's ready to cut to the heart of our souls, to help us to know our motives, whether we have sinful motives, whether we're doing things for the wrong reasons, or, or that we're becoming callous to sin. Lord, there's so many ways that we can let you down, and, and we don't want to, Lord. You've done so much for us. We want to be your people. We want to represent you well in this world, and that means that we need to change. I want to be holy because you're holy, and, uh, and that means we need to, to be moved from where we are to a, a better place. So I just pray that today our minds are open to your word, that we feel convicted when in sin, that we have a sensitivity to, uh, to know when we're wrong, and Lord, give us the courage and, and the direction to go. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Is my microphone loud enough for you? Okay. Sometimes I, I, I can't hear it exactly as it sounds. Something sounds different. But uh, once again, the uh, message is come one, come all. And really, my main idea is such an awesome one. God has room for you in his expanded kingdom. <clears throat> and really, I guess, as I looked at this chapter, I, it, you know, it kind of lends to this idea that uh, God is, is interested even in the, uh, you know, the broken people, the people that are, you know, misshapen in all sorts of ways, that they don't have it all together. And despite the fact that they may not seem like or feel like the cream of the crop, the message is God has room for you in his kingdom. There is room for you, no matter what you've gone through, no matter what has happened, God has given a, you room to be with him. And I guess as we think of that question that they were hotly debating, right, who's going to go back uh, is it going to be everybody? Or is anyone going to be excluded? And another question I'm, I suspect could be, you know, was there any qualifications needed for those to return to the land of God's promise and blessing? Was God going to expect anything before he allowed you to return to Israel? 
And really, we see that in the last chapter. Isaiah 55, 7 really pointed out, let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. Isaiah 55, 7 gives that qualification. God wants you to care. Care about the fact that you are sinful and in need of change. The the right change, the qualification he's asking is that you would turn away from your wicked ways and that you would turn to the Lord. And if you would, God would be able to extend his mercy. He would be able to do the miracle of rebirth, right, as we think of it as Christians. So before they could return to Israel, they must return to God. And really, that's what we see at the beginning of Isaiah 56. This is what the Lord says. Be just and fair to all. Do what is right and good, for I am coming soon to rescue you and to display my righteousness among you. God's charge to them was to turn to him, to be people that love justice and righteousness. For they would not be able to return to Israel until they return to God. If they want to live where God blesses them and protects them and where they enjoy peace and prosperity, they must first live in God. And I guess there's different ways to think about that. What does it mean to live in God, to return to God, to change our mind about God, to appreciate God, to leave our sin that uh, uh, stands before God? And I know, you know, some of you might be saying, well, for all have sinned and fall short of, of the glory of God, that our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Yeah, I get all that. We're, we cannot be perfect, but is God calling on you to be good? That is an indication of where your faith lies. If you love the Lord, if you want what he's offering, then you turn to him. You turn from sin and you turn to what he likes, what he wants. If you want to live in God's blessing, you need to first live in God. And ultimately, uh, we're given the strength and the, the transformation to do that when we give our lives to Christ. But here in the Old Testament, we're putting it in that context, right? If if you're going to know a place of God's peace and protection, then first you need to know God. So this moral qualification given in Isaiah 55, 7 is the one that is required to enjoy God's blessing and peace. And really, it's signified by the, in the Old Testament, by the land of promise, right? Right? God wants to bring them back to that land of promise. For you and, for you and me, it, it really involves the work of the promised Holy Spirit. How would we receive the blessings of God? Well, when would I receive the Holy Spirit? Did God require anything of us in order for us to be born again? Obviously, we have to put our faith in Christ. We need his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. But how do we get from sinful, rebellious person to redeemed and filled with the Holy Spirit? There needed to be a a transaction, a, a, a movement that occurred in our heart to recognize the depravity that we were in, the fact that we were in trouble and that we needed to make a change. I remember feeling that weight. And I know that's a a grace from God for for him to open our eyes to the fact that, wow, where I am right now is uh, in trouble. And then I think you begin to, you know, you begin to uh, shift and wonder, you know, what is it that he wants? For Israel, obviously, God was asking them to turn to him. For us more specifically, right, we understood uh, when we heard the name of Jesus that in him all could be forgiven. And really, is that any different than what Isaiah is sharing, right? We we go back to Isaiah 53, and we see that graphic description of Jesus. They fully didn't understand that yet, right? Because Jesus had not come, but they would when he did. So 
the signification of being in the land, going from the exodus of Babylon into the land of Israel, is really that transformation that happens for us, living in the land of, of condemned sinners and being transformed into a state of, of adoption into the family of God where we are given the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit transforms us and, and we're born uh, spiritually into a state that is then acceptable to God. I couldn't help but think of the, uh, when Jesus met the woman at the well and uh, he was telling her everything about her and at some point, this is in John 4.19, uh, he says, uh, sir, you must be a prophet, so tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount uh, Gerizim, where our ancestors worship? So here, this woman exposed to a, a man of great wisdom uh, in her mind, right? This Jesus sure seemed to have some insight that means that he must be a man of God. She asked the question. She wanted to know, right? Uh, as a Samaritan, they were excluded because they intermarried outside of the Jewish faith and, and, uh, and they worshiped in a different place. And, and her wonder is, where am I supposed to, you know, am I excluded because I am not worshiping in Jerusalem? And I love what he says because he puts it in, you know, some, he makes it real clear. He says, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. He said, you Samaritans know little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But look what he says in verse 23. But the time is coming indeed. It is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and and in truth. And the Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, and those who must worship and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. I only offer that to you just as an understanding that really here in Isaiah 56, God is speaking of a return of a people from captivity into Jerusalem so that they could return to a state of closeness to God and to worship. They could rebuild the temple and have the presence of God where they can continuously live for him. But there was a time to come, a time that goes beyond that, where Jerusalem will no longer be the place where we worship. What will matter is what happens in here. Will we be brought home from the land of brokenness and sin and be brought into a state of cleansing that prepares us to worship, not in a place, but in the spirit. And that's what it means to be born again, to be brought into the kingdom of God. <clears throat> in John 3, uh, Nicodemus was asking uh, Jesus, Jesus uh, answers his question before he even asks it. He says, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And he says, what do you mean? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's being born of water and the spirit. Humans reproduce only human life, but the spirit gives birth to spiritual life. To give your life to Christ is to be spiritually born and to be made into a state in which your fellowship and worship of God is no longer tied to a place. And that's the good news, right? All across the world, people are worshiping in spirit. And why is that? Because they put their faith in the one who could save them. A little further down in Romans, uh, excuse me, John 3 uh, Jesus refers to that time when Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness. Uh, this was a time when the snakes, because of Israel's unfaithfulness, God had sent snakes and they were biting them and, and they were dying from the venom. Um, and Moses cried out for relief and he told Moses to put a, a bronze snake on a pole and if anyone would look to that bronze snake, their faith would free them from the, the deadly venom that 
was coming. And here Jesus relates that. He says, Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So God was setting the stage, obviously, for the return of Israel into Jerusalem to bring about the temple, but so much more was to come. We understand that. And uh, so, you know, that first point on your explorer sheet is uh, as we think about uh, the fact that God has room for you in his expanded kingdom, You know, the first point is that God has room for the repentant. And I think that's what the first two verses are really referring to. And I think that's all-encompassing. Anyone willing to repent is welcome to come. If you come, right, if you love what God loves, if you seek what God is offering, if you believe what God says about you and himself, for you to have a positive view of God brings you close It says in verse 2, blessed are all those who are careful to do this. Blessed are those who honor my Sabbath days of rest and keep themselves from doing wrong. God is expecting his people to care about what is right. And if you think about it, what what would the, uh, without the temple, when they were excluded from Jerusalem and brought into Babylon, what could they do to stand out? One of their primary things was recognizing the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, they were to not work. And you know that stood out, right? The Babylonians would have, on Sunday, probably done what they did the rest of the week. But here's a people of God saying, no, no, we're going to honor God. We're going to keep the Sabbath holy. I'm not doing anything on this day to honor my God. And that got noticed. Why, you know, why would you do such a thing? And as you can imagine, it would lead to all sorts of Uh, teachings of what God had done in the history of the world and for the people of Israel. And ultimately, those who, uh, who have that attitude towards God, they would experience the salvation that God was bringing about. It says in verse 1, I am coming soon to rescue you and to display my righteousness among you. Really, the the word is salvation. Uh, Interestingly, uh, one of the the things I was reading said, uh, salvation is just another word uh, for salvage. And what's salvage? Anyone here like going uh, thrift shop, go to uh, Salvation Army to bring new life to some poor item that's been abandoned? That is salvation, something that had no use but to sit somewhere and to be offered for a couple bucks could have new life, could be brought into a place of worth. That kind of puts a whole new light on, on, you know, thrift shopping. You know, my wife sometimes chuckles at the things that I bring home. But that is what salvation is. It takes something that's perishing and useless and makes it something worthwhile to save. And that's what the Lord is going to do for those who take notice of his will, who care about his will. And really, if someone cares about the will of God, they would care about the Lord Jesus Christ, right? If they love the Father, they would love him. So here it's interesting, right, to to give this qualifications, these morals. And really, you could not benefit from the miracles unless you embraced the morals. And I think that's an interesting point. So the miracle of salvation, it's linked to his values. The blameless life will be the blessed life. And sure, we won't be sinless, but if you care about what's good and right, and God's offering you to be cleansed of all that isn't right, you would jump at it, right? You would understand, wow, you know, I could be cleansed before the Lord. I could be blameless through the blood of Christ. We don't hesitate on that. So as I think about the fact that God has room for you in his expanded king, kingdom, 
I couldn't, couldn't help but think of that quote from the Jaws movie, we're going to need a bigger boat. For that, it was because of the bigger shark. But as far as, you know, the kingdom of God, God's kingdom was expanding. And here we see, you know, firsthand an expansion of who would be included. It had to be someone who was repentant. But not only that, it, it even extended to those who were broken. The idea of... Uh, foreigners and eunuchs, it's an interesting thing to think about, and it really speaks to the ethic of God. So on your explore sheet, God has room for the repentant. The next thing I think it's worth talking about is that he has room for the broken. That's one of the best things to share about Jesus is you don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be a person that is worth giving salvation because God cares for the downtrodden. He cares for the the people that are in pieces. Verse 3, back to uh, Isaiah 56, don't let foreigners who com- commit themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will never take, uh, let me be part of his people. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. The next thing it says, don't let the eunuchs say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future. The Jews may have looked and said, well, these people that are now permanently marred because of the, uh, you know, that simple operation that enemies could do on their uh, captives, right, to, to one clean sweep, you're done having kids, the Jews could get snobby about that and say, well, the Bible's pretty clear, you know, you're excluded. Deuteronomy 23.1, this is one of those verses where I... I Boy, the, gra- the graphic nature of the New Living Translation, I decided to pick the NIV to, to talk about it. The word is emasculated. And if you were emasculated, there was something damaged about you, and you were not allowed to be in the assembly of the Lord. So you were excluded based on your physicality. It said, no one who has been emasculated by the crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. Thank goodness for other translations, I'll tell you. That was a... Easier to say. Some presume that uh, Daniel and Nehemiah may have been deprived of the power to have children uh, when they were taken captive. Uh, And that's based on subtle indications uh, when you go to the original Hebrew language for these verses. They say that it seems pretty clear that they're indicating that they, you know, fell victim to that treatment. Many of the leading men of Israel were probably made eunuchs. And as cruel as that is, a a crueler thing would be uh, for them to never uh, feel a part of what God was doing. So what God does, he answers it for them, right? They're all asking, will the eunuchs come with us? Why would they? And it says in the second half of verse 4, or excuse me, verse 4, it says, this is what the Lord says, I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. Is that eunuch someone who cares about my will? Someone who cares about justice and righteousness? Because if he does, despite the fact that he is not whole, he is mine. I like that. Isn't that nice? Anyone in this world who feels broken and apart from normal humanity is, uh, is not excluded because of their physicality. And then he, uh, he gives the verse, I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. Because that would be the depressing nature of having no children in the sense that no, no, nothing of me will go on to the next generation. And God's saying, no, no, I got that taken care of. I'll give you something better. I'll give you a memorial. I'll give you a name that will last forever. Far better than what sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. And that's what is uh, at stake, Right? For someone to reject the will of God and to think that God doesn't care about them is to underestimate how good God is. God cares about the lost sinner. He cares about the broken sinner, the one who thinks there's no place for them. 
Luke 15, 7 says, There is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. God cares for the downtrodden. And that's, that's important for us, right? As we lift God up to be the, the God that is beyond uh, the scope of all other gods, the God of greatest conceivable beings, nobody could shine a light on the God of the Bible. And this is just more evidence to that, that he is for the broken. Who else is uh, God for? God is for the foreigners too. Look at verse 6 in Isaiah 56. He answers their question about that, right? Will the eunuchs be included? Yes. Will the foreigners who are amongst us now in faith be included? And the answer is yes. He says, I will bless the foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord, who serve him and love his name, who worship him and do not desecrate the Sabbath day of rest and who hold fast to my covenant, right? If this is a, a foreigner who has come alongside you and cares about the things of God, I'm going to bless them. And then look what it says. This is a, a verse that's quoted by Jesus when he comes into the temple and sees the misuse of uh, the temple. And I'm going to explain a little bit of that. But look what it says. Verse 7, it says, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. Here, for the first time, we're seeing uh, a shift to the inclusion of Gentiles into that house of prayer. So that's a, that's a pretty important moment in time, right? We can put a pin right here that here God is saying that foreigners will not be excluded from the temple, but they will be drawn in because my house will be a house of prayer to all nations. What does he say? I'm going to accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer, a prayer for all nations. For the Lord, the sovereign Lord, who brings back the outcasts of Israel, says, I will bring others too besides my people Israel. So that third point on your explorer sheet is the fact that God has room for the excluded. The Gentile nations had been apart from God because they, were, they had not the knowledge of God or uh, the attention of God, but that was changing. The Jews might have been tempted to say, you know, you're not able to come with us because the promised land is for Israel. But verses 6 through 8 says that the temple, when it would, was rebuilt, would have a place for them. And that's exactly what happened. When that next temple that was built, uh, before, by the time Jesus came, that temple was standing, right? It was rebuilt by uh, Herod on the pattern of Nehemiah's temple. And the biggest court of all was deliberately called the court of the Gentiles. It was there so that Gentiles could come and pray in Jerusalem. And there it was. A lar the largest court of the temple was called the, 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 the court of Gentiles. And that was the place where God fulfills his message that he would bring them all. He would accept their sacrifices. He would make his house a house of prayer for all nations. And what did Jesus find when he came in? Do you remember he got upset and he broke out a, a whip and he started turning tables? They were money changers. That large court was literally turned into a marketplace where people were making profit by selling sacrifices, by exchanging money. And Jesus was upset because God had made a place for Gentiles and man had filled it and made it into basically a Walmart. Jesus entered the temple... It says in Matthew 21, 12, he entered the temple and he began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. Why? Because they were on the court of the Gentiles, the place for them to be included. And then it says he knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs 
of those selling doves. And he said to them, the scriptures declare, Isaiah 56, 7 declares, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to see him in the temple and he healed them. God has a heart for not only the broken, but for the excluded. And there was a place for the Gentiles, but they were not honoring what God had said, and Jesus was upset, rightfully upset. That's, like, that's some righteous anger. God is no respecter of persons. He looks at the moral qualities. He looks for righteousness. And it is on that basis that he accepts or rejects. Right? And maybe you'd say, well, nobody's righteous. Well, if you trust in God, that's deemed you're blameless before God. If you have faith in God as Abraham, then you have the attitude that God is looking for. You care about the things of God. And this was a big uh, issue. We've been studying uh, the book of Galatians in uh, our Bible study, and that's kind of the big thing going on in there is the, uh, the Jews who were... Uh, really attached to the law in such a way that it became more than a way to relate to God. It became a God in and of itself. And they began to try to make the Christians that were Gentiles adhere to the Jewish laws. And really, they end up dealing with that in Acts 15 at the uh, Jerusalem Council. Let me just read you a snippet from that. This is verse 7. It says, At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So here, Peter is proclaiming the inclusion of Gentiles, and it was confirmed by the fact that they, too, were receiving the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen says, Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slave, and some are free, but we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share that same spirit. And then Galatians 3, uh, 2, it says, Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. At the end of the day, the only thing that's going to matter is if people turn from their sin and turn to the only solution God has provided, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, God has room for you in his expanded kingdom, but it has to be because you're a, a heart that is uh, willing to repent, and even though you might be broken or excluded, you accept God on the terms that he presents, that you need this Holy Spirit, and that Spirit can't reside into it, in you until you've been cleansed through the blood of Jesus. The last point, I guess we can come to a close here, is God has room for the abused and neglected. And I included that because really 9 through 12 is speaking about the fact that the leaders of Israel were dropping the ball. As it says, they were silent watchdogs. Imagine that, having a watchdog that couldn't bark. And that is what the leaders of Israel were. They were not helping. They were actually causing more problems. And you can imagine people were falling victim to that. They were being misled for that. They were discouraged by that. And are those people who are neglected, discouraged, abused, mistreated and fall short because of the leaders not included? I think God's including this here to say, you know what, I saw what those people did. And they will be punished. And they're the ones who are responsible. Those are the ones who are responsible. They were supposed to be the ones who were bringing uh, 
their you know, joy and presence in the nation of Israel. But guess what? I, I'm bringing the broken, the excluded, the abused and neglected, but these, these aren't going to be part of what I'm doing. Let's uh, just look at Matthew 21, if we could. Matthew 21, then we could close in a word of prayer. Matthew 21, and I, I, I think verse... Uh, well, I guess we could look at verse 28. I was talking to someone last week about this verse. What matters in the end is what you do with your, your will. Not what you say you're going to do, but what you really do. And then Jesus uh, really explains the meaning of what he's saying, and he's excluding the religious Jews and, and showing that the tax collectors and prostitutes would get into the kingdom before them. It says in verse 28, But what do you think about this? A man has two sons told, a man with two sons told the older boy, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. And the son answered, No, I won't go. But later he changed his mind and went anyway. And then the father told the other person, uh, excuse me, the other son, You go. And he said, Yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? And they replied, the first. Obviously, uh, instant response to the, the message is, is uh, not always the case. But Jesus here is saying, once you know what you're supposed to do, don't tell me that you're going to do it. Do it. And because they wouldn't, Jesus explained the meaning. He says, I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins." God has room for all in his kingdom, but they must come on his terms. And the terms of that is to believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, why don't we take a moment to pray and, and thank God for his generosity. Maybe you feel unworthy this morning, but I'll tell you, if you've done what God has asked, then you can be thankful and grateful for the fact that God made a way that you could accomplish. You can trust in Jesus. Well, let's pray. Lord, uh, I'm grateful for this opportunity in Isaiah 56 to enter into this new section of promises and, and helping Israel to move from a, a place of captivity into uh, the, the land of Israel. But Lord, we know this is a, a veiled shadow of the fact that he was going to mo move sinners uh, away from uh, a life of destruction into the kingdom of God, where we would experience love and peace in a way we could never understand fully. So, Lord, we are grateful this day that you are a God that includes the broken and the neglected, the abused, and, uh, and we just ask that uh, we never limit who might hear the message, Lord. We might think people are too far gone to hear, but, uh, Lord, you, you perform miracles, and, uh, and we see even today that people come to you. And we're grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen.